Well, sing a hymn, pastor, they said, or have you forgotten how? Well, sometimes I wonder. Hey, guys, it is so great to be here worshiping with you guys together. Just want to get this out of the way up front. I've been with you guys for uh, eight weeks now. This is my eighth week in the pulpit, my seventh week as your pastor. I have uh, kind of been derelict in one of my duties as a pastor. Not one of you has called me on that yet. I'm a little bit disappointed. I haven't quoted Andrew Peterson lyrics at you yet. Perhaps the greatest theologian, singer, songwriter that exists. We're going to get that rectified today. I just wanted to take care of that up front. We're going to get that rectified next week as well. So you can just expect a steady stream of that. But we're going to be in Matthew chapter 13 this morning, starting in verse 44. If you've got your copy of God's word, why don't you go ahead and get open to that now. Well, Sadhu Sundar Singh was born around the turn of the last century, around the year 1900 in India, and he grew up a very angry teenager. His mother sent him to a Christian school in India, but when he was just 14 years old, his mother died. So angry and distraught was he that he took his copy of the Bible and began ripping it apart page by page, burning each page as he went. It didn't make him feel any better, and so one day he planned to kill himself. And he shook a fist at heaven, and he said, Unless there is a God who will reveal himself to me, I'm killing myself tonight. That very evening, he had a vision of Jesus. He committed his life to Jesus there in India, but his father and his other family, his brothers who remained alive, they weren't too thrilled with what had happened. And they began trying to kill him. They tried to poison him several times. They even took venomous snakes and threw them into the house where he was living. Nevertheless, Mr. Singh stuck with his new faith. So overcome was he with the message of Jesus that he began traveling through the Himalayan mountains to share the gospel. He traveled into Afghanistan. He traveled into Tibet various random remote regions. So successful was he in sharing the gospel that it became known all over the world that this young man was preaching about Jesus. And so an agnostic religion professor from Europe tracked him down and came to visit him. And this agnostic professor was doing some research in the idea of comparative religions. And so he said, when he found Sandhu Singh, he said, tell me, young man, what have you found in your new Christian faith that you didn't discover in the traditional religions of India. And he looked at him and he said, I found Jesus. And not to be deterred, the agnostic professor said, no, 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 but, but what principle or what doctrine or what teaching did you discover? And again, he looked him in the eye and he said, what I have found is Jesus. And so we're in the middle of a four-week series answering the question, what does it mean to be gospel-centered and we've talked about how the gospel grabs hold of our hearts and radically reorganizes our lives by changing our thinking and our desires and our priorities. But today I want us to zoom in, not on the effects of the gospel, but on the person who makes the gospel possible in the first place. And that is Jesus. So to be gospel-centered, you have to see Jesus for who he really is. Our main point this morning is very simple. Jesus is the treasure. Years ago, I was in the Moody Men's Collegiate Choir. I'll, I'll pause there because my wife and my daughters are in the front row and they're giving me a look like, how? <laughs> the choir was very gracious to allow me to have a slot. But as we traveled around, we used to sing an old hymn called Fight the Good Fight. And it had a really compelling line that this old hymn would build towards. Listen to these lyrics. Fight the good fight with all your might. Christ is your strength and Christ your right. Run the straight race through God's good grace. Lift up your eyes and seek his face. Life with its way before us lies. Christ is the path and Christ the prize. Well, lots of people know some basic facts about Jesus. If you've seen those late night talk show hosts that take microphones and they interview random people on the street, I think if you did that, you would find lots of people could give you lots of answers about Jesus. Hey, have you heard of that Jesus guy? What do you think of him? Well, yeah, I, I've heard of him. He was a good teacher. Yeah, I've heard of him. He was a, he was a good prophet. 
Yeah, I've heard of him. He died on the cross. Yeah, I've heard of him. And, and we have all these ideas about who Jesus is, but sometimes we miss the reality of who Jesus truly is. See, I think some of us think of Jesus as the person who will grant my wishes like a genie, or Jesus is like a trump card who I can play over and cancel out all my troubles. I remember an old band back when I was in high school and college called All Star United, and they came up with a song. I love these lyrics. Maybe you've heard these. It says, uh, my Jesus decal does quite a trick. Right above my dashboard, I stick it. A good luck charm, it keeps me from harm and saves me from speeding tickets. Isn't that how we often view Jesus? Jesus is just there to make my life better. Jesus is there to hook me up with what I think I need. And in fact, you remember the first time that you got serious about prayer? You were probably in junior high or high school. And your prayer probably went something a little bit like this. Lord, I know I didn't study, but I pray that your spirit would reveal to me the answers to this test. Use my neighbor's paper if necessary. Isn't that how we view Jesus? He's the one who gets me what I need when I need it. And we have this idea that we have a Jesus on demand who's there to hook us up. But here's what I want you to hear this morning, what we're driving at this morning, what we're going to let Jesus say in his own words in Matthew 13, is that Jesus is not the tool we use to find a great life. Jesus himself is the treasure that we find. Whatever it was that we thought would provide a great life, whatever we used Jesus to acquire, we find that that treasure is not actually treasure. So instead of just trying to use Jesus to get to life's treasures, we need to see anew and afresh that Jesus himself is the treasure. And with that background and that main point already in our minds, we're ready to look into Matthew chapter 13. Starting in verse 44, we just have three verses that we're going to be looking at this morning. These three verses form two short parables that are tied together to make one main overarching point. Now, studying a parable is a little bit different than studying, say, one of Paul's letters or one of the big treatises in the New Testament because we're not tracing an argument. What we have here in Matthew chapter 13 is a story. And so you don't develop a flow of thought through a story so much as you make observations about the story. So this morning, from these three verses, we're going to have three observations about Jesus being our treasure. And our outline points are going to each complete that main phrase, Jesus is the treasure, dot, dot, dot. We're going to fill that in with three things. So let's dive in by reading the passage. And here's what these three verses say. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought that pearl. Jesus is the treasure. Let's start with this thought. Jesus is the treasure no matter how you find him. So did you notice the two different ways that the two different guys in this parable found the treasure? So we have the pearl guy, and we have the field guy. And the pearl guy is a fine pearl merchant. He spent his whole life looking for a great pearl. And so the search is on, and he was looking here, and he was looking there, and traveling here, and traveling there. And finally, after years of searching, he found the pearl. The other dude tripped over something in a field. It doesn't matter how you found Jesus. It just matters that you found him. Now, it's interesting that the uh, original disciples, when they first heard this parable, this was Jesus giving a parable just to his 12 closest followers, probably would have hit them differently than it hit us because Jewish people had this idea that Jewish people were land people and Gentile people were sea people. And so if you kind of look at these parables, you see that the first guy was traveling around on the land and the second guy was traveling around all over, likely because he was an international traveler. You could picture him traveling in boats across the sea. And the idea is this, the Jewish people thought of themselves as land people because they lived in God's promised land and the land gave them identity. 
The land gave them foundation. The land gave them something on which they could build their lives. And yet even though they had all that identity and that foundation, they didn't have what they really needed. And they still stumbled across the treasure. And the other man, searching all over, eventually discovered the treasure. I think it's likely that you can relate more to the land guy or to the journeying sea guy this morning. Maybe you grew up in a religious family and attended church on the regular. You sang all the songs at Vacation Bible School. You went to church camp. You read the Bible stories. But here it is. You can do church stuff and miss the main point. You can be in the church building and not understand why the building was built. At some point, you have to stumble over Jesus and discover that he's not just a name that we sing in church songs, but he's the point of everything that we do. Have you discovered that Jesus is the greatest treasure in life? See, there's so many people, I think, that have grown up hearing about Jesus, and they think they have this foundation about Jesus because they know that going to church makes me a nice person. Going to church makes me a moral person. Going to church is a good thing to do for my kids, but Jesus didn't come so that we would make nice little kids who ran around in church. Jesus came to radically reorganize our hearts, and have you found Jesus to be that treasure? But maybe for some of you, your experience with the Lord has been totally different. Maybe you've been searching and searching and searching for meaning and answers your whole life. Maybe you've read deeply in philosophy and religion. Maybe you've chased experiences so that you can feel alive. And the more you look, the more you look, you feel like you haven't found anything. And then one day you find Jesus. And a few years later, you realize, I didn't actually find Jesus. It was Jesus who found me. But your whole life gets radically turned upside down. And hear this. Some people grow up near people who love Jesus with friends and family who point them to Jesus. And over time, they come to realize that Jesus is life's greatest treasure. Some people grow up around people who know and love Jesus and they rebel against it and they walk away. And over time, the Lord draws them back and they see that Jesus is the treasure that they didn't see when they were young. Other people spend their whole lives having no idea who Jesus was and they seemingly discover him out of nowhere. The question is not, how did you find the treasure? The question is this, do you recognize the treasure when it appears before you? Which leads us to our second point. Jesus is the treasure that can be overlooked. And don't miss this detail in these stories. So we have a guy who stumbles across a treasure in a field. We have a guy who finds a pearl. But what's interesting is that at the beginning of the story, somebody else owns the field and somebody else owns the pearl. And the field owner and the pearl owner were willing to part with the field and the pearl when they were offered enough money. And even though this pearl was of incalculable value, even though this field had treasure that could make you rich beyond understanding, someone was willing to pass it by. Why? Because they didn't see the treasure that was right there in front of their face. There was a news story that came out a few years ago about a man named Michael Rohr. Michael Rohr inherited a little box from his great uncle when his great uncle passed away. Have you ever had a relative pass away and you get this inheritance? You're like, really? That's what I inherited? And so Michael Rohr gets this box and it was filled with old, dusty, dirty comic books. So he tossed it in a corner in his attic for years. And one day he was having a casual conversation with one of his friends and he happened to mention, hey, you know, all I ever inherited from my great uncle was a box of comic books. And his friend's like, you know, why don't you look into that box? He's like, your uncle lived around the 30s and 40s, right? He said, uh, do you think there might be in that box action comic number one? And some of you are like, what's that? Well, action comic number one is the first appearance in comic books of Superman. And so he opened the box, and sure enough, there was action comic number one. And not only did he have the first appearance of Superman, he had the issue that had the first appearance of Batman. And so he suddenly started to clean those comic books up and knock the dust off of them, and he took them to auction. And that dirty, dusty box of comic books sold at that auction for $3.5 million. You can have treasure and miss the treasure. Now, you might be asking, why would there be treasure buried in a field? 
You know what they didn't have in that era when Jesus was telling this story? They didn't have banks or safety deposit boxes. So if you had some valuable coins and you didn't want someone to steal them from under your mattress, your option was to go find a corner of your property that you didn't think people would pass through very often, take a shovel and dig a hole and dump everything in that corner. Now you can imagine, can't you, that you would have this treasure and you'd bury it in a corner of your field and years would go by and more years would go by and how many of us, we have all this money in our account and you're like, you know what, I'm going to save that up for a rainy day and I'm going to keep saving it and I'm going to keep saving it and then you die and you've never used it. And this happened, it wasn't regular in that culture, but there would be people who would die and leave their treasure buried and they'd forget to mention to their relatives, oh yeah, by the way, I buried $350,000 in my field last week. And so eventually over time, someone might stumble across that treasure. And so finding hidden treasure in that culture was kind of like our equivalent of winning the lottery. You knew it occasionally happened. It wasn't likely to happen to you, but it could Here's the question. When you see the treasure, do you recognize it? Because there was an owner of the field who didn't search his field, who didn't know what was in his field, and who happened to sell his field. Now, so many people, and in fact, if you read the commentaries about these verses, most of the commentators spend their whole commentary sections arguing about, was the dude who found the treasure morally obligated to tell the owner of the field that he found the treasure in his field before he gave him a lowball offer? That wasn't Jesus' point at all. Jesus' point was when you find treasure, you do whatever it takes to get the treasure because the treasure matters more than anything. And so that is the point of the parable. Now, it's interesting, isn't it, that both parables begin with the phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. And so you might be asking, okay, pastor, um, here we are, we're trying to rightly interpret the Bible and you're telling me that Jesus is a treasure. That's already our main point this morning. But it sure sounds like from these verses that the kingdom of heaven is the treasure. So how can Jesus be the treasure if the kingdom of heaven is the treasure? What exactly is the treasure? How do you answer that, pastor? Well, here's how I answer that. What makes the kingdom of heaven something to be treasured? So when Jesus started his earthly ministry back in Matthew chapter 4, he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is near. It's here. It's right around you. Why was the kingdom of heaven near when Jesus started his ministry? The kingdom of heaven was present because the king was present. The kingdom only matters because of the king. And so Jesus, when he says the kingdom of heaven is like, what he is saying is the rule of the king is like. Here's a good definition of the kingdom of heaven for you. The kingdom of heaven is life lived under the reign of heaven's king. So life as a citizen of heaven means discovering the worth and the beauty and the glory and the surpassing value of the king. Jesus is the treasure. You can pass through life and miss the treasure. Not many people are going to hit a winning lottery ticket. Not many people are going to uncover buried treasure. Not everyone is going to see the reality of who Jesus is. Not everyone will have the Holy Spirit open up their eyes to see how marvelous Jesus is. That leads us to this point. Not only is Jesus the treasure, no matter how you find him, not only is Jesus the treasure that can be overlooked, but this, our main point that we're going to camp on for a minute here, Jesus is the treasure who is better than everything else in life. Here's, here's the question. When you say Jesus is the treasure, what does that mean? See, when we think of treasure, we tend to think, isn't treasure treasure? Gold is treasure. Silver is treasure. A winning lottery ticket, that sure would be treasure. But how is Jesus treasure? How is a person 
treasure. I know some things that Jesus did on the cross. I know that Jesus is a savior, but how exactly is Jesus treasure? And so when I say that you can miss treasure, what I mean is you can know that Jesus is the things that the Bible says that he is, but your heart might not understand the reality of what that means. So when I say, have you discovered Jesus for who he really is? What I mean is, has something inside of your heart come alive and realize that Jesus is more than anything else. Jesus is better than anything else. The world says, get more and you'll find what you're looking for. Jesus says, get me and you'll find what you're looking for. The world says what you need is money, popularity, fame, a great life. Jesus says what you need is me. How can I help you? understand who Jesus is? How can I communicate to you this morning the reality of the surpassing greatness and glory and worth of Jesus? Because words don't do justice to the greatness of Jesus Christ. But words are all we have to describe who Jesus is. So how can I help you see who Jesus is? How can I help you see that Jesus is more than just a sin taker, but he's a life Maker, how can I help you see that Jesus is the king of the universe? And if you find Jesus, you find what you cannot find anywhere else in this world. How can I help you see that if you have Jesus, you get what all the riches and the fame and the fortune and the glitz and the glamour cannot offer? If you have Jesus, you have something more. What is that? If you have Jesus, you have hope. If you have Jesus, you have meaning. If you have Jesus, you have purpose. And the world says everything you need is everything the world offers. Jesus says you need nothing of what the world offers if you have me because I offer you something better. Amen. That's why Jesus told Andrew and Peter one day, leave your nets and come follow me. Now, what does that mean? So Andrew and Peter were fishermen. Their dad owned a fishing business, and the expectation was that they would grow up and they would become fishermen and they would inherit the family business. And so when Jesus said to Andrew and Peter, leave your nets, what he was really saying is leave your dad and all the plans dad had for you to inherit the family business and come walk with me. And they're like, um, well, mama, mama, what do we say to dad? And he's like, um, tell him you found something better. And they're like, but, but, but where am I going? What's going to happen? And Jesus is like, just follow me and you'll see. Jesus is better. That's why Jesus could say to Matthew, the tax collector, I need you to leave your life of luxury that you've gotten from all this money that you've taken from people. And I need you to realize that there is something better on offer. And that's why Jesus could say to Zacchaeus, I need you to give back the money that you've swindled away from people that has enabled you to live this life of luxury because in me you have something better. That's why Jesus could say to the rich young ruler, I want you to take all your stuff that is making you rich and I want you to go down to Goodwill and toss it in the donation bin. And the guy's like, but what about my stuff? And Jesus is like, you don't need your stuff if you find me, the Savior. And he's like, but I want my stuff. And how many times do we have this conflict going on in our hearts? Do I want my stuff or do I want Jesus? And hear this, friends. There's a reason we say we don't preach a prosperity gospel the prosperity gospel says what you need in life is Jesus and. Jesus and money. Jesus and stuff. Jesus and fame. Jesus and a rocking, fulfilling, romantic marriage. Jesus and being at the top of my class. Jesus and my children being successful. Jesus and, well, you fill in the blanks. I don't know what that thing is for you. But the prosperity gospel that clings to our heart says, Jesus is the tool who will get me my hand. And Jesus comes in and he said, there is no hand. Jesus himself is the treasure. So if you have Jesus and nothing, you have everything even though this world says you're crazy. If you have Jesus, you get it all because he is the treasure. And how can we help your heart to see that Jesus is the pearl, that Jesus is the treasure in the field, 
Uh, you, you can't force yourself to see it. The Spirit has to show that to you. I remember the moment that that happened for me. I was 14 years old. is in between my uh, freshman and sophomore year of high school. And I was at a Bible conference, and the speaker was talking and saying, I believe that God is calling some of you into full-time Christian ministry. Is God calling you into full-time Christian ministry? And as I sat there, I felt this like shiver running down my spine, and I'm like, um, I think that might be the Holy Spirit telling me that God is calling me into full-time Christian ministry. And so as the speaker was talking, he said, if God's calling you into full-time Christian ministry, I need you to raise your hand. I'm like, yo, nope. And you know what was going through my mind? Here's the thought running through my mind at that exact moment. Why would I go into full-time Christian ministry? I'm going to be a lawyer, and lawyers make bank, and I'm going to make bank. No thanks. Of course, you know, I had those parents who didn't just send me to Bible conference once that summer. They sent me to Bible conference twice that summer. And so six weeks later, I'm sitting in another room where the speaker is giving the same challenge. And he said, where is your heart? Is God calling you to full-time ministry? And do you believe that Jesus is better than whatever you would leave behind? And it was in that moment I knew I had to make a choice. Do I want Jesus because I think he can get me the stuff that I want? As though Jesus is the trump card that I play? Hey, I got Jesus, so now sign me up for the easy life and all the stuff that goes with it. Or did I want Jesus because I believe that what Jesus offered was better than what the world offered? C.S. Lewis, famous Christian author, wrote a book that's a little more obscure. I had to read it my freshman year of college. It's a fictional work called Till We Have Faces. And this book, Till We Have Faces, is written in two parts. And the first part is written in an autobiographical style according to the words of the main character. And the main character is a woman who's queen over this land, but she has loved hard and lost much. And she's lived this tough life where even though she has the title, she didn't actually get what she wanted. And so at the end of the first section of the book... The last two words that close out that section are these words, no answer. And the second half of the book chronicles her journey to discover how could there be an answer when there is no answer. And as the book draws to a close, again in her own words, C.S. Lewis writes this, and I think it's profound. I ended my first book with the words, no answer. I now know, Lord, why you utter no answer. You are yourself the answer. Before your face, questions die away. What other answer would suffice? If you have Jesus, you have everything. Even though the world says you need a different answer and a better answer. And so this morning, friends, I want to take a moment and talk to us as a church family. I want to give a word because I believe that there are some of you here who have gone through a tough year. And as the church has been in transition, there's been some stuff that's happened, and there hasn't just been anyone here on a full-time basis to give you that big pastoral hug that as a church family I think was so desperately needed in this season, in this spring of pain and loss. And there may be some others of you here who are, you're like, okay, but, but that didn't really touch me, yet there's some other thing in my life that I'm really hurting and grieving about. And will I just offer this to you? How can we be gospel-centered, seeing Jesus as our treasure, when life is hard, when things are lost? Friends, so often we buy into the subtle thinking of the prosperity gospel. I trusted Jesus, so I deserve all the good things in life. Jesus should see me and give me what I want because I embraced him. Why should other people get the good stuff, yet not I, who've trusted in Jesus? And so we begin to think that what I really need is Jesus and a long and happy life. What I need is Jesus and 
the painful situations to be resolved immediately and without repercussion. What I need is Jesus and my precious loved ones to never have anything bad happen to them. How could I possibly be blessed by Jesus if the people I love are hurt or if they die too soon? How can I believe that Jesus is the treasure when what I really want is the treasure of my friends and my family just being there? How do you answer that question? Here's how I begin to answer that question. Friends, I know my church history. And I know that Jesus had 12 disciples. And of those 12 disciples, 11 of them died young because they traveled across the world to India, to Africa, to Western Europe, spreading the name of Jesus. And in each and every instance for 11 of them, they were forced to choose your life or the name of Jesus. The apostle Peter, remember him, the guy who left the fishing nets? They said, Peter, it's Jesus or your life. And Jesus said, you know what? Take my life. But when you take my life and you crucify me to mock me as though you're killing me like Jesus, would you crucify me upside down because I'm not worthy to die in the same way Jesus did? You're like, okay, but that's only 11 of the 12. What about the 12th guy, the one that got blessed with long life? Did he really? I mean, that, that's the Apostle John, and he just happened to get burned alive in a vat of hot oil and survive. So um, do you see the point? They were all willing to die for the name of Jesus. Why? Why? Because they saw in Jesus something that was better than life. They saw in Jesus something that was better than what the world said they needed. Jesus didn't come to offer us a charmed earthly existence. Jesus came to offer us himself, and Jesus is better. And so in the midst of hurt and pain and loss, let me speak over you some words of the gospel. Jesus is better. That's why Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, I'd rather die and go be with Jesus. That's better by far. Let me say this. The only thing we can do when our heart is hurting and when we're questioning if Jesus is better is to preach the gospel to ourselves over and over and over and over again. Day by day, remind myself Jesus is better. Jesus is better. Jesus is better. And here's a phrase that I've latched on into my mind, and I'd like to gift it to you this morning. Heaven is not a consolation prize. Heaven is not a parting gift for the people who didn't get what they should have gotten on earth. And so whatever, have eternal life, go live on the streets of gold. You at least get something, exit stage left. No, no, no. I think that if you talk to someone who is in heaven today and said, would you like to go back and live out those 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 years that you didn't get before, would you trade what you have with Jesus for what you missed on earth? And I believe that each and every one of those people would say, Jesus is better. And you're like, but, 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 but how do I get there? My heart wants to believe that, but I'm not believing that. And I tell you this, you preach the gospel to yourself day by day by day. The words are not a magic bullet, but the Holy Spirit will begin using the truth of the gospel to transform your mind. And so as day by day, you repeat the truth to yourself, slowly but surely you get to the place where in the words of Andrew Peterson, the aching may remain but the breaking does not. You get to the place where you can say, though I have lost much, I have found more because Jesus is better. And so friends, what I'm asking you to do in whatever pain or grief or loss you find yourself is to preach the words of the gospel to yourself over and over. Jesus is better. Jesus is better. Jesus is better. Jesus is better day by day until one day your soul can soar over your situations and circumstances and begin to sing with all the saints, oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. I see some of you nodding. You know that song. I think what might be good is in this moment if we sang that chorus together 
And you might say, my, my, my soul's not strong enough to sing it right now, Pastor. You let us sing these words over you and let the truth minister to your soul. Will you sing those with me? Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. We're not done singing yet. The band's going to come forward. And I think that this closing song is an opportunity for us to cement this truth into our hearts. We're going to sing a song called Jesus is Better. And I love the line of this song, make my heart believe. Maybe you're in a place where that's all you can muster is, Lord, make my heart believe. Friends, I don't think Jesus cares much about the posture of our bodies. He cares about the posture of our hearts. And so maybe what you need to do this morning is sit and just let these words be poured over you and minister to you. Maybe you want to stand and raise your hands and declare, I believe. Maybe you want to kneel just say, Jesus, whatever my and was, I don't need it because I have you. You're the treasure. You're the pearl of great price. But for some of you, maybe this morning, you're in a place where you're like, I need someone just to pray with me and pray over me because I've gone through a hard season and I just want someone to pray words of hope into my life. And if that's you, as the music begins playing, I'm going to stand up here at the front and there'll be some other leaders from our church who would just love to meet you and pray with you. We're not asking you to come forward and say, I don't think I'm a Christian. We're just asking you to come forward and say, I just need someone to pray with me to re-cement the fact that I believe Jesus is better. We'd love to pray with you and over you. So however the Lord leads you to respond,